Yeah, Chance to chat with you. At 6.30, right? At 6.30, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Shall we begin? All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm Jess Mandel, a chief of the Pulmonary Critical Care Sleep and Physiology Division. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the inaugural John West Lectureship. This is a terrific academic industry partnership to advance understanding and dialogue around important issues related to pulmonary physiology. I just want to give thanks to many people. Thanks to Jason Yuan, who really had the idea and really helped get this going. Thanks to Steve Lee from Metapines for supporting this. Thanks to Skip Garcia for coming out and really launching this on a very high note. Um, and thanks to multiple staff members in the division for really making this go, everything from reserving the room to publicizing it to all the things that are necessary for a successful event. And finally, I want to give thanks to uh, Dr. John West for inspiring not this, just this lecture series, but really inspiring the entire field of respiratory physiology and pulmonary medicine very, very broadly. Dr. West is one of the world's most noted and accomplished respiratory physiologists. He was born in 1928 in Adelaide, Australia, and obtained his medical degree from the University of Adelaide in 1952, and then moved to England to continue his training and research. His many insights, particularly into ventilation, perfusion, matching, and high altitude physiology, have set the paradigm for all who have come after him. In 1968, Dr. West moved from the NASA Ames Research Center to UCSD as one of its founding faculty members, and really all who have come through UCSD since that time have benefited immensely from his teaching, mentorship, and example of engaged and productive scholarship. We all value Dr. West enormously as a colleague and are proud to see him honored by this lectureship. Please join me in thanking Dr. West for his many contributions to UCSD. And to the field. I would now like to welcome UCSD's Physician-in-Chief, Dr. Wolfgang Dillman, to say a few words as well. So I would like to um, thank Jess Mandel for having given a large part of the introduction for John West. So I'll be a bit, little bit uh, retep repetitive. So thank you very much for coming. It seems there is standing room only for the first John B. West Lectureship. I also would like to thank Dr. Steve Lee of Medi Pines for playing an important role in making this possible. And congratulations to Dr. Garcia for being selected as the first West Lecturer. So a few words about John West. As just mentioned, John was born in Adelaide in Australia a city at the level of the sea of the Indian Ocean, where he went to medical school and he obtained his MD degree at the age of 23, uh, which I didn't manage to do, uh, in, 19, <laughs> in 1951. And then in 1952 he moved to London, where he actually got to know his wife. And he spent 15 years in London doing very interesting research. He used radioactively labeled oxygen 15, if I'm correct, and basically studied lung function, blood flow, and that's where his interest in gravity on pulmonary function started. In 1969, John joined UCSD, and I assume, maybe I can stand corrected, Dean Clifford Grobstein, and the then chair of the Department of Medicine, Jean Brownwald, played a role in enticing John to come to this new medical school and becoming a founding faculty member. And John, as mentioned, pursued his interest in pulmonary physiology, especially influences of great gravity and weightlessness on pulmonary function. And he had for a very long time uh, NASA support to do very interesting uh, study. There's something I wonder a little bit about because in John's geographic neighborhood in Auckland, also at the level of the sea of the South Pacific, Sir Edmund Hillary was born, a beekeeper from New Zealand, who set his mind to being the first human on the top of Mount Everest, which he achieved in 
1953, and uh, Sir Edmund had also a very strong interest in physiology. So from what I know is John learned that Hillary planned a physiological expedition to Mount Everest. He applied and was accepted, and I think capability in the shared geographic neighborhood being down under may have played a role <laughs> in it. So here were these two men born at the level of the sea and having a desire to reaching the highest mountains. John's expedition put several climbers on top of Mount Everest, and this was the first time pulmonary function tests were performed at the level of 29,000 feet. Other exceptional heights for John were reached in his teaching effort for all the learners, medical students, residents, fellows, faculty, and also the general public through his books. So just in closing, several days ago, I participated in a walk through research buildings uh, looking at space. So we went to the medical teaching facilities, the second floor, and there was John in the lab discussing research results and pointing to graphs and so on. Remember, <laughs> I said hello to you. That shows from my point of view true passion, which never stopped. So John, stay around. We need more of you and faculty like you. And thank you very much for all you have done. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. John, you, it's time for you to say a few words. I just want to put my slide on. It's okay. Uh, okay, well, I don't have much to say. Um, I certainly want to thank everybody for this uh, very lovely occasion. And I, say that I see that we have a very large number of students here, which I attribute to the free lunch. But, I, <laughs> but I'm sure they've come to hear Dr. Garcia as well. Um, I uh, am very grateful for this opportunity to, um, to uh, celebrate, I think, uh, the scientific foundations of pulmonary medicine. And we have a long tradition here at UCSD, right from the beginning. Uh, as was pointed out, I was one of the first faculty members here. Uh, it was at the same time as Kenneth Mosier, who uh, started the pulmonary division. And uh, our division of physiology has, has been very productive, but also the division of pulmonary, sleep, critical care, uh, medicine has been very productive as well. And uh, it's a, a great pleasure and very stimulating to be in this environment. Um, incidentally, I was born in 1928, not 1858, which I think was said. <laughs> but, uh, and also, the chairman of medicine at the time who, who um, uh, uh, chose me was Jean Brownwood. And that was a, a wonderful period at the beginning of this medical school. I came in, actually first came in 1968, and then joined the faculty in 1969, and uh, it was an extremely productive, exciting, stimulating period of my life, a wonderful period. And I've become, I became extremely interested in teaching, partly as a result of that. So I won't take up any more time, but I'm just delighted that um, that uh, Skip Garcia is here. I noticed, by the way, that my na name is incorrectly spelled too. <laughs> it's Bernard, it's B-U-R, but don't worry about that. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, John. And, uh, I uh, just personally thank uh, the Medikines, uh, the company who actually made the donation for this event. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask uh, Steve Lee, the CEO of Medikines, to say a few words about how the industry and academic to work with each other.
Well, um, it's a great privilege to be launching this all important event at UCSD. So as a medical uh, device industry professional, I believe that advancing respiratory medicine is a national health priority uh, today. Uh, as you, most of you know that about COPD as an example used to be fifth leading cause of death, now it's third, and in, uh, they're predicting that COPD will probably become the leading cause of death in the world in about 15 years' time. And we have about over 30 million Americans suffering from respiratory illnesses, and on top of that, we have baby boomers, 77 million of them are retiring at a rate of 10,000 every single day. So we have, uh, as lung function, uh, we all know that lung function declines with age, so we have increasing respiratory burden on our hands, so instances will rise substantially. In other words, we have a tsunami of respiratory crisis in our hand in coming years. Unfortunately, a respiratory disease has not been given proper attention and funding and uh, in compared to other uh, major causes of global morbidity and mortality. So it is very timely that UCSD is launching this series on respiratory. Now, uh, to tackle you know, this so-called tsunami of respiratory challenges, education, useful, technological advancement, uh, important, but technological advancement by itself will not solve the problem. We need scientists, uh, practicing physicians, and uh, medical uh, community to really band together and identify a solution that works. And not only works in the clinical practice, but the cost has to be effective, you know, cost effective, and also it has to be time efficient. So as a as an entrepreneur, I was trying to figure out a way to help solve this looming healthcare problem in our uh, country. And met up, uh, fortunately met up Dr. West, preeminent scientist in respiratory physiology, six decades as an educator in medicine and over 500 peer reviewed journal publications to his name. I mean, he had insight that was just deep. And when I uh, was introduced to him uh, a while back, he was working on a technology that uh, a ways to measure impaired gas exchange rapidly and quickly, uh, non-invasively. And uh, we worked together on, on, on figuring out a way to commercially deploy this in, in clinical practice. And in the course of assessing feasibility of this method, and talking to uh, uh, various physicians across the nation and, and other countries, it became very apparent to me that we're sitting on a, a novel technological solution to a very serious respiratory problems in clinical practice. An insight, uh, the West insight was that if you can identify proper measurement, and if you, if you can do that in a very uh, easy way, then you could improve uh, the uh, you could improve assessment, prevent, uh, identify preventive cases in respiratory. So this was a key that unlocked opportunity for a clinical application. So um, over uh, time, uh, fast forward uh, several years later, product was built on Dr. West innovation, and it's. Uh, Really being released commercially this year as we recently received FDA clearance. So we're very excited about uh, seeing the fruits of his, his, his innovation um, and it's just the beginning. And what's really interesting is during the course of uh, identifying clinical uh, feasibility, I met up with uh, physicians across the nation, US, Canada, Europe, Asia, South America, and virtually every physician I know or I've met uh, knows of Dr. West. And in fact, uh, everyone's telling me that John West is respiratory physiology. So I've never met a physician with such global name recognition. And I basically go on and tell people, he's a walking single man brand in this field. So uh, it is only fitting that this lecture series is named after John B. West. And so thank you, Dr. West, for your profound contribution to respiratory physiology.
Thank you, Dr. Jason Yoon, for initiating this wonderful event. And you know, uh, thank you all of you who are working tirelessly, the physician practitioners and researchers who are working to improve the lives of respiratory patients. With that, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. And I just want to show uh, uh, another slide before I introduce our speaker. Uh, let me just, uh, here we go. So this is the device that actually John is uh, still doing experiments with students nowadays. And as you can probably see that um, uh, 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 this is a device that is developed by the Medikines. And basically, you can use this uh, little device to actually uh, uh, estimate the gas exchange capability in patients and, of course, in animals. And uh, if you just look at this, is a paragraph and actually cited from a recent publication led by Dr. John West in chest. And using this device, you can actually estimate the uh, oxygen deficit deficit in normal subjects and COPD patients. And you can see that in COPD patients, the oxygen deficit is certainly much greater than the normal subject. And you can use the equation developed by John uh, for a long time to estimate the gas exchange cap capacity. But I do want you to focus on this person, and that would be me, <laughs> and uh, functions as a guinea pig for Dr. West and uh, his students. And uh, so after a series of tests, a very serious questions from the doctors, they finally find that uh, I'm normal. So, and then we had a good picture. So, uh, so it's a great honor to, uh, uh, and also of course, uh, thank Steve and thank Medikines for the support for this event and for continuous liaison between industry and academic research and uh, in order to find a cure for patients with lung pulmonary disease. So I think it's probably not uh, uh, difficult for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Joe uh, Skip Garcia. And I've just summarized, uh, you know, it took me a while to summarize what I should say about Skip, but I do want to mention a couple of things is that uh, he's a visionary leader and he has served many uh, higher rank um, positions in different universities and help the health sciences improvement and development. And he's a productive scientist. He has more than 560 publications and uh, his edge index is about 100. And he is uh, currently involved in $30 million in edge funding. And of course, he has developed two companies to develop novel therapies for lung diseases. And he has uh, had uh, 12, more than 12 pat patents. And I do want to mention another thing is that he's a very hardworking educator. And I have been involved with some, some of the training programs we skip to train minority students, junior faculty, postdoc fellows, pre-doc fellows. And he's always been very, uh, um, I would say personal about his trainees, and uh, and I think uh, he's uh, definitely an absolutely good mentor. And I don't want to go through all of these uh, awards and honors he has had, and that would be too long. And he also has served on many endowed professorship, and. Um, has been invited to give lectures internationally in many countries. So without uh, too much overdue, Dr. Garcia, our first uh, inaugural John West lecture of this series. So is this working now? Seems like it is. So uh, thank you, Jason, for that, as usual, over-the-top introduction. I really appreciate that. Uh, and I just have to say what an honor it is to be here to be the inaugural John B. West uh, Distinguished Lecturer. Um, yeah, I think the history uh, and impact of pulmonary medicine at UCSD has been you know, so obvious to anyone in our field for decades. And I don't think anyone exemplifies uh, the impact of the science and new knowledge generated here at UCSD better than the iconic figure that John B. West uh, uh, exemplifies and has done so for so many years. Um, Dr. Dr. West, is, as everyone's mentioned before, has impacted our field in so many ways. I think uh, 
Uh, virtually 100% of individuals trained in pulmonary critical care medicine are familiar with these books and this, his work, and they've been the basis by which he's moved our field for so many years. And so I just want to uh, make sure that I, I say how deeply uh, grateful I am to the committee to be selected to, for this um, honorific um, e event. So. Um, as uh, the title of my talk has, uh, has indicated, uh, we're using, I'm going to talk about systems biology approaches to acute lung injury. And um, the, uh, the overall value and, and impact of that approach is to try to identify ways that we can, you know, focus on critical care illnesses, which are obviously an important part of our healthcare expenditures here. Um, you know, they account for 20% of our health care costs, which are going, continue to go north. And I think uh, I'd have to say that insights into um, basic mechanisms and uh, uh, insights into novel treatments for critical care illnesses have been pretty incremental. But one important, I think, uh, insight has been the role of inflammation throughout each of these processes. These evolutionarily conserved inflammatory networks are the reason that these patients die and they die of multi-organ failure, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, particularly in the context of this uh, disorder called acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and you would think, because we have some insights into inflammatory networks, that we would have some new therapies to be useful in this arena. The fact is that, uh, I think as, as Steve Lee just mentioned, um, unlike oncology and cardiology and cardiovascular medicine where there's been breakthrough drugs that are FDA approved, every drug in the ICU is generic. So, so why is that? Well, um, this slide sort of says it all. When you get to phase two and phase three trials with novel therapeutics and critical care illnesses, whether it's sepsis and ARDS, they have uniformly failed. I think the very high profile clinical trial, and maybe you want to do the, dim the lights in the front, I don't know if that's possible or not, but um, uh, the high profile trial was, uh, was Zygris, you know, activated protein C. Eli Lilly spent a lot of money in developing this drug and uh, ultimately went through several phase three trials before it was pulled from the market. More recently, the scam interferon-like uh, drug made by a company called Ferron was uh, a Finnish company uh, completed a phase three trial that was very expensive in Europe and uh, in May of this year, uh, of May of this year, and it turned out that this drug also failed. So um, again, the lack of FDA approved therapies for critical care illnesses such as sepsis and ARDS remains a staggering unmet need. So um, these are the institutions that I've uh, had leadership roles in over the last, that's perfect, thank you so much, over the past uh, several decades. And these are the entities that I've been focused on in my lab and with my research group. Um, and uh, the thematic underpinning of this kind of work has been that we're really trying to use these systems biology approaches, going from genes to proteins to cells to animals and, and to people to identify novel biomarkers, try to identify new molecular targets for this work, try to understand, I'm very interested in health disparities, which is a big issue in, in our country, of course, and trying to understand risk and severity factors that are, you know, have a impact on health disparities in our country. And that also leads to the idea that we need to be doing better subphenotyping, identifying patients that are uh, at um, most likely to respond to a, particularly, uh, to a particular medicine. And, you know, th these are the disorders that we've focused on in our lab, but the one that has clearly been paying the bills for a long, lot of this time has been our work in ARDS and in ventilator-induced lung injury. So for, for those of you that may not be aware of what ARDS is, acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome, this is an inflammatory disorder uh, with mortality rates of 30 to 40 percent. They have drifted down over the decades, but even today they remain at 30 to 40 percent. And the chest x-ray looks like this. This is uh, an x-ray of profound uh, pulmonary edema. And uh, the hypoxia associated with fluid-filled lungs like this um, is uh, the reason these patients wind up going on uh, ventilators 
And this occurs in response to a lot of different stimuli shown here on this slide. And most commonly, it's acid aspiration, trauma, and severe sepsis. Um, but there's, as you can see, there's many other causes. And this heterogeneity is a complication in trying to do clinical trials in patients with ARDS. And because of the work of breathing, when your lungs are full of fluid, the work of breathing is enormous. These patients, and they're hypoxic, the patient uh, uh, undergoes respiratory failure and requires mechanical ventilation. So I would say an, the incremental nature of what we've learned in this critical care field, one of the important insights is the role of the ventilator into, into uh, <coughs> stimulating increased inflammation which uh, has resulted in uh, increasing number of, of deaths in the ICU, a syndrome that we know is ventilator-induced lung injury. So once again, there are no FDA-approved therapies for, to reduce ARDS mortality or the contribution of ventilator-induced lung injury to that. So just, just to dive a little bit historically into the background for ventilator-induced lung injury, this is a paper published quite some time ago um, by the uh, ARDS network. And uh, I was a chairman, uh, chair of the protocol review committee when this protocol came through uh, from Hopkins. It was from one of my faculty at Hopkins. And I have to admit, you know, I thought this was really not so smart a study, you know. But as he was my faculty member, I said, okay, you know, we'll, uh, we'll help this along. Turns out this is the only study in all of the critical care literature that's ever been positive. It's a landmark study. And what they showed here is that by comparing patients being ventilated on a ventilator with a low tidal volume, meaning a smaller breadth than the conventional tidal volume, you had a mortality savings. So you had mortality benefits shown here. If you look at inflammatory cytokines, IL-6 levels were lower. So the question became, what's the mechanism behind this lower tidal volume improvement in mortality? And I showed you a chest x-ray earlier that showed the chest to be diffusely involved. As actually, when you do CT scans, the chest is not, the lungs are not hetero, hetero, homogeneously involved, they're very heterogeneously involved. You have areas that are over distended, you have areas when they deliver a breath where the, the uh, lungs are collapsed, and you have areas of the lung that have shear stress due to opening and closing. So we wanted to understand the mechanisms that were involved in these issues, so we took a very genomic approach to this. So we exposed mice and rats and dogs to these various preclinical models of lung injury. You know, <laughs> ventilator-induced lung injury, LPS to mimic the infection, took RNA from these lungs. We hybridized that to uh, microarrays so we could look at genome-wide expression of the genes involved in these processes. We did bioinformatic analysis and developed signatures for um, various uh, uh, inflammatory pathways in the hope of identifying novel genes that we could test again in preclinical models. So we did many, many, many studies like this. I would say probably 70 microarray chips, which were quite expensive back then. And uh, when we pulled, when we pulled those data, you know, this is uh, pooling data from rats, mice, dogs, human cells that were stretched, and to do a bioinformatic analysis where we filtered stringently for genes that all only went, went in the same direction in a significant way, we came up with 50 genes. So these 50 genes we were able to evaluate, and if you look at the list of the 50 genes, you find some genes like IL-1 beta and IL-6 that were very, you know, sort of like not so surprising. The ventilator and stretch cause inflammation, and these are card-carrying inflammatory cytokines. And what we're showing you here under PubMatrix terms, we used a, a program called PubMatrix that you could blast these genes against all of PubMed and it tells you how many papers f with the headers that you devise and that gene there are. So you can see under lung, lung injury, mechanical ventilation, lots of papers involving IL-1 beta and IL-6. But what we thought was more interesting among these 50 were a handful of genes in which you did the same sort of PubMed blast and there were absolutely no papers relating these genes to lung injury, mechanical ventilation, endothelial cells, et cetera. And so we thought this would be very, very high yield for genes that might be novel in, in being able to uh, understand some of the pathophysiology occurring in, in ventilator-induced lung injury. 
And as a proof of, the, of we've published papers on each of these genes, by the way, and you know, just to give you an example with GAD45, this is, this is a gene that uh, was previously thought to be only involved in regulating DNA damage repair, but we show that this is a candidate gene in acute lung injury. We show that it's, it is involved by influencing critical uh, signaling pathways involving AKT. We also demonstrated that the mechanism by which GAD45 regulates AKT is by regulating the deubiquinase UCHL1 uh, pathway. And uh, we sequenced the gene, we found polymorphisms that are associated with risk of acute lung injury, and we showed that this gene and its polymorphisms are involved in, in additional models of, uh, of inflammatory lung injury. And so another, another, uh, another approach that we've used to try to, again, use systems biology approach is we've taken patients, blood from patients, isolated the peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Again, with this RNA from these patients, we were able to do microarray genome-wide exploration. And we showed that we had identified signatures that help predict or help subphenotype patients, which we think is an important to moving our field forward. So like for fibrosis and sarcoid, we found signatures that show an increased uh, mortality in patients with certain gene uh, signatures, certain gene signatures that suggest an increase in complications from sarcoid. In sickle cell, we had signatures that, uh, that denoted an increased mortality risk, and the same for pulmonary hypertension. And we've done that for ARDS as well. And when we look at the genes, just to get back to this bioinformatic approach we talked about, when we took PBMCs from patients with ARDS, identified those who lived, those that died, and compared, differentially compared those genes, we had a 20 gene signature that predicted survival. And of those, three of those 20 genes are genes that we, I just showed you were on the slide that came from our 50 gene uh, um, orthologous gene approach. GAD45, IL-8, and IL, IL-1, R2. So the, if you look at genes that are differentially regulated in live versus diet ADR, ARDS patients, you put them into categories, you can do a pathway analysis, and when we did that, we found that TOLAC receptor signaling, a very mainstream innate immunity pathway, was differentially uh, increased. And it's going to bear, uh, for the rest of this talk, it's probably worth remembering this TOLAC receptor pathway as being important in figuring out who lives and dies with ARDS. So we're, right now we're evaluating this signature, trying to demonstrate whether we can predict earlier on who is at risk for ARDS mortality. So the gene I'm going to spend a, a fair amount of time talking about today is, is called NAMT. And you can see NAMT at the bottom, there are like no papers. When we found NAMT out of this broad 50, 70 gene microarray approach, no papers in PubMed literature at the time. And uh, again, just to re re emphasize to you again, the, the way we got to NAMT, we did experiments like this. This is a dog in which uh, <laughs> on the left, you could see that the uh, one lung has been bronchoscoped and lavaged we removed the surfactant from that lobe, uh, from that lung, and then we put an endotracheal tube into that lung, we put an endotracheal tube into the other lung, and ventilate them at different tidal volumes, and you can see the whitish lung that's injured compared to the control lung that's uninjured. And then you can see the CT scans uh, that show the heterogeneous nature of the, of the disease with atelectatic or collapsed parts of the lung at the base. And the circles represent areas of the lung where we took out tissue, isolated RNA, and hybridized it to, to chips. And so when we did that, <coughs> you could see that uh, we had a very uh, clear heat map. This, these are called heat maps that show the differential gene expression in the different parts of the lung and in the injured lung. So these kind of heat maps, I'll, I'll show a couple of them later on, so it's very worth sharing with you that each row is a gene. Each column is a different site of tissue, either from the control lung or the injured lung. And squares that are in green are low expression, and squares that are in red are high expression. And you can see the injured lung has much higher expression than the control lung. And uh, <clears throat> if you look at one of the genes that was highly expressed in these experiments here was NAMT. 
And the reason we chose NAMP is because it was almost impossible to ignore. NAMP turned out to be a gene that was one of the top three genes in nearly every one of these 50 to 70 experiments. So we decided to, uh, I remember the lab meeting where we were talking about should we go after this gene? And we said, well, we don't have any money. Okay, well, let's go after it anyway because it's, there's reasons to think that it might be a good high yield gene. And here's the reason that we went after it. So when we, when we blasted in PubMed, eight papers in all of PubMed. Four of them were in the immunology literature, saying it's a maturation factor for B lymphocytes. Well, we categorically dismissed that because we know nothing about immunology. But we went to the other four papers, <laughs> which really were kind of interesting to us because they were in the OB-GYN literature. And this was a gene in amniotic membranes that was induced during gestation. So stretch was a potential mechanism by which this gene was induced. And since the lung is being differentially stretched during acute lung injury and mechanical ventilation, we thought it might be a high yield gene. So what we next showed is that, yes, we, we developed an antibody to the, G, to the protein. And we showed that this protein is in bronchovalar lavage of patients with ARDS. We measured it in the blood of patients with ARDS. In our preclinical models, we showed that gene was induced by the ventilator. Um, we showed where in animal models the gene is being induced, and it's in leukocytes, lung endothelium, and lung epithelium. And here I'm showing you a picture of blood vessels from spontaneously breathing mice and mice exposed to high ventilator-induced lung injury. And green is NAMPT, and you can see green and von Willenbrand's factor are uh, in the same area uh, as shown on the right. So let me tell you a little bit about NAMPT. So NAMPT is a cytosine. This is a class of proteins that are, serve two functions. Uh, it's an intracellular enzyme. It stands for nicotinamide phosphoribosyl transferase. So it's an enzyme in the cell. And in doing so, it takes nicotinamide and it makes nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Very important um, metabolic pathway regulated, regulating sirtuins and other signaling pathways. And it's actually a target in some oncology uh, trials going on because FK866, which is an enzyme inhibitor of this intracellular enzyme activity, has been used in phase two and phase three cancer trials as an anti-neoplastic agent. Um, those aren't doing so well because there's a lot of toxicity when you block this enzyme intracellularly, but it's telling you that it appears to be a, a good target in oncology. So one role, one, this, one role for this protein is as an intracellular enzyme, and the other role is as a secreted extracellular cytokine. So NAMS transcribed, it's secreted from the cell, and it, it serves a cytokine function when, it's, when it moves outside the cell, uh, a function that we, we described uh, a number of years ago. So we know a lot now about how the gene is induced. We've done many experiments, I'm summarizing here on this slide, many experiments where we showed uh, different uh, uh, pharmacologic stimuli, as well as mechanical stress, activates a number of transcription factors, including uh, STAT35, very important in mechanical stress-induced uh, uh, induced, uh, <coughs> transcription, HIF2-alpha, NERF2, and SP1. And these transcription factors go to the nucleus, increase transcription of, of, uh, of the gene. We've also uh, spent a lot of time understanding the, what regulates transcription here. We've identified sites in the promoter of uh, DNA methylation. So the NAMPT promoter is um, heavily demethylated during inflammatory diseases, that, and we've shown what sites those are. And the other part of epigenetic regulation is regulating the three prime UTR. And so we've shown, we've identified sites in the three prime UTR of the gene that are binding sites for microRNAs. And we've identified two microRNAs that, that regulate the gene and, a, and a influence its expression. And the end result, of course, is that the gene is transcribed, intracellular NAMPT gets secreted and becomes extracellular NAMPT, enamped. So, um, so how are we sure that this gene and protein are involved in acute lung injury? Well, one important way is to identify whether any variants in the gene are associated with risk of the disease 
or severity of the disease. So we sequenced the NAMP gene, and we found very few uh, SNPs that were in the protein coding regions, the exons, where we found a lot of SNPs in the promoter. So we spent a lot of time understanding promoter regulation of this gene. And this is a schematic of the promoter, and you can see there's some, some sites there for different transcription factors. But using what's called deletion construct analysis, we chopped up the promoter into different sizes, and we showed that this area right here in the yellow box is the area that regulates the response to mechanical stress, and it does that in a very STAT-5 uh, dependent manner. We've also mapped out the area of the gene that is very heavily influenced by HIF2-alpha. HIF2-alpha is a very potent regulator of NAMT expression. HIF2-alpha is a hypoxia-inducible factor, so hypoxia is a very strong stimulus for NAMT expression. And we've also identified polymorphisms in the gene. We've sequenced the gene, and we've evaluated a lot of SNPs in the gene. And these are four SNPs that we now know influence promoter activity, and as seen here, are also associated with increased ICU mortality and increased number of ventilator days. So, very good evidence that this gene is a candidate gene in ARDS. Associated with the disease, polymorphisms drive and confer risk and severity of the disease. So, how is it and is it directly involved in the pathobiology of ARDS and, and ventilator-induced lung injury? Well, went back to animal models, including adding NAMP, purified NAMP down the airway, comparing it to bacteria down the airway, ven and villi and trauma, and what we showed here in using genetically engineered mice and some rats that in fact, and we, we evaluated these animals using standard phenotyping tools, what we found was that you put NAMP down the airway, it causes neutrophilic inflammation of the lung. And if you use these, these mice that are heterozygous for the NAMP gene, and we didn't use knockouts because knockout mice are lethal, embryonically lethal, these NAMPT HET mice were very protected from ventilator-induced lung injury. And this is just a very quick uh, example showing you that BAL protein in the first panel, BAL neutrophils in the second panel, or IL-6 levels in bronchovial lavage. In each case, the heterozygous mice that are exposed to the vent show a, an attenuation of the levels compared to wild-type mice. And so it looks like NAMPT uh, expression does drive uh, um, ventilator-induced uh, injury responses. But a really key uh, way of showing that this protein is a participant in the inflammatory cascade is to use neutralizing antibodies. So we generated some neutralizing antibodies, a polyclonal antibody, and here I'm showing you some data with the ventilator-induced lung injury model, and you can see that the NAMP antibody-treated mice are very protected. And when we use rats and mice that are exposed to a combination of the LPS and ventilator in the same experiment, you show that the antibody also was protective under those conditions. And so an intravenous delivery of an antibody, which is very easy to do in the ICU, uh, to give an IV delivered antibody, it attenuates both the one-hit ventilator-induced lung injury model or the two-hit model. So this is showing you expression that goes along with what I'm showing you with the antibody. You can see here when you look at mouse leukocytes that are exposed to the vent, there's very prominent NAMPT expression shown here in brown. Here's a, here's a rat tissue that's exposed to LPS in the ventilator in the same experiment. So very prominent NAMPT expression in these two models. We also looked at two other models, one being a rat that's exposed to a blast injury followed by placement on mechanical ventilation and that showed prominent uh, NAMPT expression, as well as a, a pig uh, that was exposed to smoke inhalation. And the reason we did those experiments is that blast exposure and smoke inhalation are very common aspects of a trauma-exposed soldier. Uh, and so we were interested in these preclinical models of trauma. And, um, you know, to, in sync with that observation, when we looked at ARDS patients, uh, compared to controls, and trauma being a major cause for lung injury in, in ARDS, we showed that ARDS patients have much higher levels of ENAMP in their plasma compared to controls, and that the levels uh, in it 
as opposed to many biomarkers in, in ARDS that are going down with time, ARDS uh, patients have an increase in, in their levels of NAMP. And we also, um, we also looked at uh, NAMP levels in, in soldiers that were exposed to trauma. So in these, panel C are, are, are soldiers in Afghanistan and D are soldiers in Iraq exposed to trauma, blast trauma and smoke inhalation. And you can see that the, these soldiers have higher levels of NAMPT that look a lot like the ARDS levels. And like ARDS levels on, in, in the ICU, the NAMP levels are sustained over several days following their exposure to, uh, to the trauma. So we wanted to sort of see whether we could recapitulate a, a, a preclinical model of, of trauma. And so um, these kind of pieces of equipment are only available in certain parts of the world. But of course, our military in, San, in San, Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio has this shock tube. So they can deliver a defined blast to an animal, rat or pig, and, uh, and it, when you do that, those animals develop, because the lung is full of air and it's very hypersensitive to blast injury because it's an airfield uh, entity, uh, you develop a, an acute inflammatory lung injury. Shown here in the first two panels are the blast at 3, 24, and 48 hours in rats, and on the right is a pig exposed to a blast as well. And you can see the inflammatory lung injury that occurs there. When we do expose rats to uh, assess the potential involvement, we already shared with you that a blast exposed uh, rat was, uh, had high NAMPT expression. And here you see the injury associated with a blast injury followed by four hours on the vent. If we treat those rats with a polyclonal antibody after the blast, you see this marked attenuation in the inflammatory response at, still after four hours of ventilation. It's consistent with the idea that this ENAMP neutralizing antibody really does attenuate this, this mo preclinical model of trauma and ventilator-induced lung injury, and that's shown on the far right where we have the injury score um, delineated. So how does NAMP do this? So that, that's a big question. What's the mechanism by which NAMP is provoking this this inflammatory injury and, and that allows it to be a therapeutic target in, in ARDS. Well, we went back to our gene expression data. Shown here is gene expression ontologies. You take the gene expression data from your animals that are exposed to either NAMPT down the airway or to ventilator-induced lung injury, and you take those genes out, you plug them into uh, pathway analysis. They give you these gene ontologies that are shown here. And uh, we compared those responses to the NAMPT heterozygous mice as shown in the gray bars. And when you do that, uh, we were very taken by the fact there's a strong signal for NF-kappa B signaling. NF-kappa B is a transcription factor, very much uh, activated uh, uh, in inflammatory uh, uh, models. And so we wanted to ask the question, well, maybe NAMPT is directly activating NF-kappa B. So this is a phosphorylation assay of NF-kappa B showing you that NAMPT added to in vitro human endothelial cells causes um, phosphorylation of, of uh, NF-kappa B consistent with activation. We've used other, other uh, complementary approaches and this is just looking at the translocation of, uh, of NF-kappa B to, uh, to the nucleus um, seen here. So clearly NAMPT is inducing activation of of NF-kappa B, which, be, which suggested to us that the receptor, it's a receptor-mediated event, but we didn't know the receptor, and we spent a long time trying to identify that receptor. It took us a lot longer than I thought it was going to take us, but we finally found out that this receptor is, in fact, toll-like receptor 4. TLR4 is an innate immunity you know, receptor that activates, potently activates uh, NF-kappa B signaling, and in our work, we show uh, activates and induces inflammatory lung injury. So the, the way that NAMPT binds this receptor, TLR4 is a pretty promiscuous receptor. It binds HMGB1, it binds some hyaluronins, it all, but it's mainly interest in innate immunity is because it binds LPS. LPS binds TLR4, 
And this is a major signal for that the organism's under attack and, and being invaded. But it, LPS by itself doesn't activate the receptor. It needs this, this chaperone protein called MD2. MD2 binds TLR4, LPS binds MD2, and that activates the receptor. MD2 by itself doesn't activate the receptor, LPS by itself does not. In contrast, what we found is that NAMT by itself activates the receptor. And we found that we think that the mechanism by which this happens is that there's, our computational modeling showed that there was very, sim very high similarity in the structure of NAMT in these loop regions in MD2. And then when we looked at the sequence within these loop regions, we, sat, we found that there was sequence homology between NAMT and MD2. And so NAMT has intrinsically as part of its structure the capacity to bind MD2 binding sites and to activate the TLR4 receptor without the need, without the requirement of a cofactor chaperone. Very interesting, we're continuing to, continuing to work on these aspects and the role of polymorphisms in, in guiding these, these TLR4 and NAMP interactions. So we now know we've kind of completed the circuit. Uh, ENAMP binds TLR4, it activates set of kappa B, it causes the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, the cytokine storm as it were. So it made TLR4 a pretty good target for attenuating ARDS and ventilator-induced lung injury. The problem with that is what? The problem with that is number one, they've done studies in sepsis, TLR4 was actually um, injurious. Antagonizing TLR4 is injurious and sort of makes sense. You probably want TLR4 to be working if you want to have a, a guard against infection. And so we have pivoted and we've kind of moved more towards identifying mechanisms of, of identifying a a therapeutic target that neutralizes ENAMP, and we started this company called Aqualung that is heavily uh, focused on identifying a, a monoclonal antibody to do just that. So the, uh, the schematic, sort of the thematic uh, underpinnings for this is that a number of uh, stimuli occur, and they, uh, the injurious stimuli, stimuli that, that you know, cause the organisms to, to fear for survival, they activate these damage-associated molecular pattern proteins, of which NAMPT is one. NAMPT binds TLR4, activates NF-kappa B, and the cytokines that are elaborated there cause uh, inflammation and dysfunction in multiple organs, including the lung. And so, uh, this is, in fact, a very, a highly evolutionarily conserved pathway of activation involving NAMPT. NAMPT, if you look at the sequence of NAMPT, you compare it across multiple species. If you compare it, you compare it to bacteria, you know, there's strong homology between the sequence of NAMPT and these other species, uh, as, you, as you can see in the slide here, where it's uh, 95 to 99.9% to homologous. So this is an evolutionary conserved pathway that NAMPT is inducing. And as a result, we think it, it's a very viable target for treatment. And the treatment, as I mentioned, would be to generate a monoclonal antibody that neutralizes NAMPT, leaving the TLR4 receptor free to ligate LPS if that were the situation, but not immunocompromising the patient by virtue of, of blocking the TLR4 receptor. So we have, uh, you know, in our way of thinking, ENAMPT is in the blood, it binds its TLR4 receptor inducing activation. Our antibody will bind the NAMPT molecule. It actually, it, it binds it as a dimer and that would prevent TLR4 activation. We've come pretty far with this program. We've, uh, we started off, um, I got a grant from the NIH to generate murine monoclonal antibodies to, to NAMPT. We did that did a lot of subcloning, eventually came up with two mu mur murine monoclonal antibodies that worked well in our preclinical models. We've, we've humanized those mouse antibodies, generated uh, and screened a lot of humanized monoclonal antibodies, and now we have a lead uh, humanized monoclonal antibody that worked very, very well. And these are just some data from a variety of the humanized monoclonal antibodies that we've screened either with the one-hit LPS model or the two-hit LPS and ventilator-induced lung injury model. 
we can see here that our human, uh, humanized monoclonal antibodies serves to reduce uh, injury here by over 40%. And, and it looks like this when you treat animals with the antibody that are exposed to LPS and ventilator-induced lung injury. So we're very excited about having a bleed monoclonal antibody. But um, the question is, is that what makes us think that we're going to be any different than all those trials that have been tried in ARDS and sepsis that have failed? Well, we think we have three shots on goal here. And let me go through why we think that. Three shots on goal for a successful trial. So first, first of all, here's the paradigm we're working with. The exposure of a patient to sepsis, trauma, placement on a ventilator, inducing ventilator stress, results in increased NAMPT, which binds a TLR4 receptor. That increases the cytokine uh, expression into the blood, cytokine storm. And what we, patients in the ICU die of, they don't die of respiratory failure, what they die of is multi-organ dysfunction and multi-organ failure. So this is what we're trying to mitigate with a, with a, uh, with a enamptor antibody. So a lot of trials, basically all the previous clinical trials in this space have targeted downstream cytokines, number one. And more importantly, when they've given that intervention, the intervention is delivered anywhere from 12 to 24 to 48 hours after the patient's already made it to the ICU. And many, you know, the clinicians in the room will know that in many ERs, patients are in the ER ventilated on, the, on a ventilator before they even go up to the ICU. So we think that that is way too late. The inflammatory cascade has been massively activated. And our approach is to provide this antibody, so shot number one, provide this antibody at the time the patient's intubated. You know, that would take the ventilator-induced amplification loop out of the equation. So to go to our second shot on goal, you have to understand that the lack of biomarkers in this space has also been problematic. There are no biomarkers that clinicians routinely use that have any predictive value for who lives and who dies in the ICU. Something I think very important for trying to conduct a, a clinical trial to identify who's most likely to respond to a, to a treatment. So what we did was we, we generated a panel of 11 biomarkers as shown here. They fall, fell into different groups, including vascular biomarkers, inflammatory cytokines, cytosines, and the RAGE pathway. So we had ELISAs for all 11 of these biomarkers. And we used 250 patients with very well phenotyped ARDS, 100 controls, 30% mortality in the group, and 20% of African descent individuals. And we had plasma on day zero and day seven, and, what, <clears throat> and we uh, retrieved these data, 11 biomarkers in these patients, used 80% of this cohort to derive a panel of biomarkers most predictive, and we tested that with the other 20%. And we used a, a number of different stra statistical strategies to, to assess these results, including predictive analysis, CART, and latency class uh, analytics. And uh, to, to show you where we're at with this right now, we, uh, we've, we identified two classes of, in this, in this, using these 11 biomarkers, we used two classes, one with a high mortality, one with a lower mortality. And the, uh, the four biomarkers that were most predictive using this uh, CART uh, uh, strategy for analytics are shown here, which is MIF, IL-8, IL-6, and, and ENAMPT. And that had a 85% risk of a 28-day mortality. So what we're at right now is we're in the process of validating this biomarker panel in uh, two different groups, large number, 500 and 800 patients to see how predictive this panel survives when we're using, uh, uh, assessing patients earlier in their ICU course. So that was our second shot on goal, a predictive biomarker panel. And our third shot on goal, we think, is this genotyping panel. So I, t I shared with you already that we sequenced the gene. We found SNPs in the promoter of NAMPT that predict risk for ARDS and mortality in ARDS. And we want to use these four SNPs in the genotyping platform as part of a way to assess a patient as they come into a clinical trial for their mortality risk. So, so the, the clinical trial that we're thinking about 
you know, we're, we, we're probably a year away from having the FDA uh, approve uh, our humanized monoclonal antibody for, for use in people. Um, you know, we have to conduct some uh, pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic uh, analyses and toxicology analyses, but because it's a humanized monoclonal antibody, I'm not very concerned that we'll find some off-target effects like you find with small molecule inhibitors. We think we're going to get through the FDA process pretty, pretty well. And then we'll test it in normal volunteers. We'll test it in some individuals that we're going to select patients that have moderate to severe ARDS, not mild to ARDS. We want, I think, moderate to severe ARDS, different doses. And our phase two trial is to try to compare now, compared to placebo, a couple of doses of our antibody. And then the, the home run shot, we hope, would be to do a trial. And we're, we're not entirely clear right now as to how we're going to use the biomarker panel, how we're going to use the genotyping panel. We know that we, they could be helpful in identifying high-risk patients. We don't know how difficult that will be for recruiting patients to this trial if we were to use them. But the idea here is to, to test to see whether the an antibody in patients with moderately severe ARDS actually have a benefit and uh, can reduce the number of days they're on the ventilator and perhaps uh, increase their su survival. So it, it's a tall order. This is, you know, I'm, I'm certainly uh, aware of the, uh, of the challenge here, but I, I kind of like the idea that we're, we're using different strategies in a, in a therapeutic that we're delivering early, early in the course of the disease to maybe dampen the inflammatory response and, and get patients off the vent faster. So um, we think it's a platform technology. We've, we have animal models and very, very good animal model data and a number of other entities as shown here. Uh, I was talking with Jess earlier in pulmonary hypertension. We have a, an R01 in pulmonary hypertension in NAMPT and NAMPT antibodies, and we have it in other, uh, other disorders as well. But it just shows that you know, inf inflammation is sort of the interface between you know, fibrosis, vascular remodeling, you know, and neoplasia. And so it's going to be a target uh, in a, a lot of different processes. So what I've tried to show you is this. We've used systems biology approaches. And uh, going to uh, the question of can these be used to address the precision medicine in the ICU, we think we can. Um, and uh, we think that ENAMPT, um, ENAMPT, which is a gene, you know, is encoded by a gene eight papers in the world, you know, that uh, now we've shown is a, is a candidate gene in ARDS. It's a biomarker in ARDS. It's a risk gene and a therapeutic target. So it's sort of the poster child, we think, for how genomics can be applied to um, disorders to identify novel targets. And uh, I'll kind of close with this picture. This is the Johnson Flood. Uh, uh, Johnstown Flood, um, I was leafing through a Smithsonian magazine and came across this picture, and because I'm like uber focused on inflammation, I thought, oh my God, this is a picture of inflammation. Look at that, you have flooding, you got fire. So the Johnstown Flood was a, you know, a very horrendous event in, in Pennsylvania when the dam broke, you know, it came rushing down and you know, some 2,000 people were killed in this flood. But we, want, we need a therapy that prevents this kind of inflammatory damage. So with that, I'm gonna just uh, show you the slide that's got many of the people in my group, collaborators from, uh, from around the country, including Jason and Ayako, uh, who are dear friends and, and good collaborators as well. And uh, say thank you so much for, for letting me be here to be part of this wonderful event. Thank you. <laughs>